one of the things that impeded my success for a long time was my comfort level with being successful and that I actually felt more comfortable in chaos when things were going wrong or I perceived them as going wrong. Um, the reason for that was that um, I, I think that when things were going wrong, <laughs> we're having some issues here in the studio, I think, um, um, but when things were going wrong, that I kind of knew how to handle that. I, I, I know what to do when, you know, crap hits the fan. It's when things are calm and I'm feeling safe that I think I'm waiting for the, the shoe to drop. And couple weeks and and what is that and our guest today uh christine park who i will talk about a little bit more in just a second um we, we were having this great conversation and the idea of negativity bias came up and i was like wow i can totally relate to that so let me give an example of it so imagine that you are on a beautiful hike uh in in the mountains and along the trail you encounter a rattlesnake. So what do you think you're gonna remember more vividly on that hike? Are you gonna think about the most beautiful hike you've ever been on, or is it about the snake that you've encountered? And most people will remember the rattlesnake incident better. Um, and why is that? Because negative experiences tend to affect us much more than positive ones. And this phenomena is an example of negativity bias. So anyone who's listened to this show knows that I really am into definitions um, because usually I'll be using a word and then um, if I'm with my father, my father will be like, are, are you sure that's the definition of that word? I'll be like, oh, maybe it's not. But anyway, so I really like to make sure that we're all on the same page. So looking up the definition of negativity bias, um, the, the, the definition said, or, or the dictionary said, that negative bias, negativity bias, is the tendency for humans to pay more attention or give more weight to negative experiences over neutral or positive experiences. Even when negative experiences are inconsequential, humans tend to focus on that negative. And I was thinking about uh, when I was in plays, and I could get 10 amazing reviews, and then I would have that one review that you know was saying that I maybe had things to work on, and that is the review that I would focus on. And I would put more weight to that. And even today, you know, if I if I'm at work, you know, I get ten great comment compliments, and someone gives me one comp, you know, one one feedback item, I'll tend to focus on that, or a review of my book, or even a review of this show on Facebook. You know, someone will make a comment about something, and I'll be like, I'll focus on that one. And um, I I get it. And I was talking to to, to Christine earlier that that yeah, I get it. Like it is a human thing that we look for the dangers. Now we look for those things that could cause us pain or be quote unquote dangerous. So um, I get it. And and I don't I don't want to say that there's anything wrong with that. And I was thinking, how does this trait affect our ability to create success in our lives? And I think there's two things of that is that, you know, there's that that idea of looking for the negative or, or putting more weight on the negative, but also this idea of this, you know, I think it's success thermometer or success comfortability. And um, I think that both of those play into this and that if we can find a way to start focusing more on the positive to start seeing the light, seeing the world through a positive lens, that I think that will affect the way we create our experiences in life. And let me let me let me rephrase that. For me, that is that is definitely what has happened to me. And I, and looking and, and working with others, that is what I've noticed in their lives also. Um, I, I love it. I was anyone who knows me and follows me on Facebook knows that I'm really into quotes. And Linus from Peanuts. He said, you know, good things last eight seconds and bad things last three weeks. And I found that in my life that I will, I will, you know, something negative will happen and I will hold on to that. And I think that I try to deconstruct it to figure out how not to make it happen again or is there something I missed, et cetera. So um, in my life, I have, I have put too much emphasis on negative things. 
And I also get it because when I'm with friends, have you ever noticed that conversations sometimes, I won't say all the time, but sometimes will focus on the negative that people will say, to you, hey, how was that trip? It was good, but you should, have know, you should have seen what happened at the hotel when we were trying to check in. And then it becomes this, I, people seem to bond over these, these experiences. Um, in contrast, I think that sometimes when we share our successes, um, those things that go well in our lives, that sometimes people, there's, there can be a wall between us and, and others. Um, it might be the way that we share it, you know, and the focus on ourselves. But I also think that sometimes we come up against other people's comfortability with their success. Um, there's a theory out there that we get comfortable with a certain amount of success. And is if we hit that threshold, we're okay. But if we go above that, that's when we start to feel uncomfortable um, for, a, for a variety of reasons. Maybe it has to do with our background, how we grew up. And we feel like we're going against some unspoken contract with our family that, you know, who, you know, you know it might be the comment from our, our aunt saying, well, you know, huh, someone's getting pretty you know, big for their shoes. You know, well, maybe that's telling us, you know, subtext, you know, you think you're better than us. So we don't want to feel that way. Or maybe it's this feeling, and, and I have had this feeling of like, if I get too much success, like I can, I can hit that success one time. But if people expect me to hit it all the time, wow. And that that's a lot for me. So it's I'd rather play it kind of small, you know, and, and hit something I know I can always hit. Um, or other people, um, there's a variety of reasons why, you know, that success thermometer, our, comfort, our, our success thermostat is set a little lower. And um, the idea is how do, we, um, how do we kind of raise that up? And... As I said, I was thinking about that this week. This is this is what I do as a coach. I think about this stuff for myself. I, I want to say, you know, I would love to say that it's, it's just for everybody else and how to help them. But honestly, it's selfish. How do I do better too? Um, and I was thinking of gratitude, and we've talked about gratitude before. But gratitude is a way for me to instantly change those pair of glasses from viewing the negative uh, into kind of viewing the positive. Um, and it can be very, very small. Just think of the smallest thing I'm, I'm grateful for. And that can change um, in, in the moment. But then also, if each day I make a concerted effort to start looking to the, to the positive, pretty soon it becomes a habit. Um, and, and we've talked about before, and, and many people have read you know, books about how to create a habit. And you know, if you do it for 30 days, um, something is going to change inside of you. And uh, things will start, start. Things will start looking a little different. The other thing, though, is to acknowledge and to purposely notice when we are uncomfortable with success, and what is that about? And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do anything different in the moment, but it's just acknowledging. Like I see a good review for my something I've done, and just notice the how do I feel in my body? And I actually sometimes feel a little anxious, and that does not make sense, does it? Like we all want to be successful, supposedly. <laughs> like in our head, like if I could just be successful, I would have X or I'd have Y. I would feel whatever. But honestly, there are some times when it actually gives me anxiety. And to just sit with that and to say, so what am I anxious about in this moment? What What is that feeling? Um, but if we can acknowledge that uncomfortability um, and to kind of hear in our, and hear in our, our, our head, wh what is it that we're feeling anxious about? That can actually kind of unlock that um, stalemate of kind of moving beyond that success. Um, as I said, sometimes it's not even doing anything about it. It's just acknowledging it. But also then kind of getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. And for me, one thing that I have done is to look for the opportunities and the uncomfortable. And in my head, I will sometimes say, ooh, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I wonder what's going to happen next. And there becomes this kind of anticipating that next moment. So, um, and the other thing is just to, I, I think that tribe that we've talked about, people that we can share our, our uncomfortability with, and uh, these are the people that know us the best and who are not going to use our moments of quote unquote weakness to maybe lift themselves up and to kind of put us down, but rather people who have our best interests in heart. 
and who know what we're doing, who know what we're doing on this journey, and to say, hey, I'm with you, and uh, and to remind us of our good, or to remind us of, yeah, you know what, I feel that way too. And together, I have a feeling that we can go to that next level. So those are my thoughts of kind of looking at that that the tendency for looking at things negatively and just to be curious of while and, and kind of find of, you know, this kind of um, um, uh, unanticipated curiosity of, wow, look at that. Like in this moment, I'm concentrating on that rattlesnake, yet I had this amazing walk. That rattlesnake was like, you know, maybe 10 seconds. Um, and I have to say, I, as a side point, I think red are pretty cool, so I, I would definitely kind of focus on that. But, but just you know, challenge myself. Wow. So what about that? What about that great walk? And just to, just acknowledge that. So, um, and this leads me into my guest, and the whole theme of today is how do we look at the world? What pair of glasses do we put on? And how does it affect what we create, those successes? And how does it affect those detours that we make in our lives, those unexpected twists and turns? Um, People who are successful, um, all of them, all of them have failed at one time or another. The successful people, though, have a tendency to look at those failures in a way the rest of us don't. So it's all about how we look at the world. So our guest today, as I said, has another way of looking at the world, which leads to creating a new experiences and successes. And um, after a quick break, uh, Christine Park will be back with us to share her view of the world and how it has led to her perfect detours. So we'll take a real quick break and we'll be back with Christine Park. You're listening to WGHC 98.3 FM Chicago. Change happens here. Hey, if you would like to make a donation, please go to our website, which is WGHCradio.org. I'm going to take this off. It might sound there. I'm a little more clear. WGHCradio.org. And there is a tab right at the top that says, I want to help. And we would really appreciate your help. You can also stream us live at WGHCradio.org. You can do a lot of things on our website, Bobby. You can you can like leave money, you can stream, you can like write notes. Really? Yeah, you can write notes to us and say, Hey, you're great, or hey, you know, you're amazing, or hey, this is what I would like to see on the radio. Please. So WGHCradio.org. This message has been brought to you by WGHCradio.org. <laughs> what was that website? I don't know if I got that yet, Skip. So um, I didn't talk to Skip at the beginning of the show because um, he was uh, working his technology um, magic, technical magic. Uh, but Skip, how are you? What's going on with you, bud? I am so excited, Bobby. Yeah? About? Yes. I... F- <laughs> Oh, I found a uh, chocolate hummus. Chocolate hummus? Oh my god, it's amazing. I see Christine's face. She's like <laughs> all lit up. Uh it is amazing. I'm gonna bring her on. Uh, Christine, have you had chocolate hummus? No, but that sounds amazing. It really, really? is. It really is. I gotta I'm, go. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw um I, I was just walking by um in Target, and it said uh, brownie batter chocolate hummus, and I'm like, I'm gonna try it. it. It does not taste. I mean, it's amazing, and there's only one gram of sugar in it. Really? Yep. And it tastes like chocolate. It has a uh, chocolate, uh, a little bit of well, this recipe has a little bit of canola oil and mm. uh, some chocolate and uh, cocoa and some stevia. That's a, what um, I'm. Sorry, I, I don't see my portion here. Where, uh, it's in the fridge there in my is office. It? Oh, <laughs> guess what we're doing after the show. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, yes, it is good on, uh, I just had it on Ritz crackers because that's all I had. It was really good. Because you're ritzy. And I got more and I took it home. <laughs> Love it. So Skip, that's, thank that's, you. That's what I'm, that's the good news of the day. That, I found. That's I've, real good. Yeah. Real good. Yeah. Love it. 
Um, okay, so we're going to get to Christine, but we may come back to the chocolate hummus. I have a feeling we'll be back. Um, <laughs> if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Perfect Detours on WGHC 98.3 FM. Change happens here. It's, we're always changing here. And you'll, you're listening to me, Bob Kaiser. And uh, today I have uh, a special guest on a good friend of mine. Um, so I'm going to do her proper introduction and then we'll get down to business and start talking. But so Christine Park is a professor of anesthesiology and medical education at the University of Illinois College of Medicine and the director of the Simulation and Integrative Learning Institute and is also my boss, by the way. Okay, but other than that, so Christine was the 2017 president of the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, the largest healthcare simulation society in the world. During her tenure, she led a global and multi-professional collaboration to create a unifying code of ethics for healthcare simulation professionals. Um, I'm going to pop in here. Christine, how many languages has that been translated into now? I think we're up to 15 total languages, including English. That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now let me go keep keep talking about you. So she also spearheaded the Society's inaugural Women in Leadership Symposium. And um, just on a really cool note, Christine's passion in life is language and literature which then fueled her interest in simulation, education, and humanities in healthcare. Hi, Christine. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yes, so I, I just said to the listeners, you know, you're my boss, so let me give you a little bit of background, everyone, is that um, yeah. I work at uh, the Simulation and Integrative Learning Institute, which from here on out, we will just call SAIL, I'm sure, so the SAIL Institute. Um, and I've mentioned before that I'm the associate director uh, at the center, and this, uh, and Christine is the director and our fearless leader and visionary, and um, I wanted to have her on here to just talk about her. She's this visionary leader, that I, a different type of, type of leader I've worked with than I've worked with before. I'm kind of getting excited about talking to you. <laughs> so I'm talking so fast. This is cool. Um, so, um, so Christine. So first of all, tell us a little bit about what simulation is, just so everyone listening kind of knows what we're talking about. Well, you know, it's interesting that you um, have talked about negativity bias and those kinds of things on the, on the at the top, because simulation in, in its largest form we can think of as, as practice. Um, so animals, you know, play, fight. Um, um, there's all kinds of things that happen in the, in the, in the animal kingdom. Um, but what makes simulation different um, is that we create a safe container around that. So, for example, if you're play fight, fighting and you're a, a lion cub, you might accidentally get hurt and it's understood that that's part of the game. In simulation, we really don't want those accidental things to happen. And um, therefore, we have the opportunity to design to um, purposely think about unintended consequences. So what are the things that potentially could go bad that we don't want to go bad? Um, and that's kind of a positive way um, of using negativity bias. That's good. Thank you. Good, good uh, synthesizing all that together. So. Christine, how did you get into simulation? Like, uh, how did so? What's been your detours that got you to simulation? Because you're okay. an anesthesiologist, right? So, uh, yeah. first of all, I wanted to throw out there one thought about negativity bias, okay. and then I'm going to answer your question, which is, um, <laughs> I some years ago um, learned to give myself a pass on this thing that we call negativity bias because um, I was listening to um, a podcast on meditation. Anyway, in there, the, it was um, stated that we um, humans depended on negativity bias to get to where we are today. So talk about sort of detours. So if you think 100,000 years ago, the people who went out there to say, oh, my God, what if that's a tiger? We better get ready. Um, so had that higher level of threat um, assessment, mm -hmm. probably survived much at a much higher rate than the people are like, no, no, I'm sure it's just a shadow. <laughs> right. And so, you know, now today in general, we don't have tigers leaping out at us, you know, every, every day. Um, so we have, we need to have a place to pour that thing, which has evolutionarily been built into us. So it's a strength of ours. Right. We just have to learn how to manage it. Yes. Use it for good. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, so you, you asked me how did I get to where I am. So I uh, went to college um, with the um, with the commitment that I was not going to go to medical school because <laughs> my father is a doctor. I didn't want to do the typical thing, copycatting. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I ended up in medicine as a practical measure because I thought that I would burn out as a, as a literature professor, and who knows if I would have or not, but that was my decision at the time. Um, and then um, I immediately regretted it because, you know, my training in in the humanities and imagination and all that stuff was really um, not super compatible with what it takes to be a successful medical student, which is memorize lots of lists of facts. Uh, yeah. Um, so it did take me, I would say it took me at least 10 years to get me to really embrace who I am and what I do, and simulation really was a piece of that. Okay, and and how does tell me a little bit more about that? So, how is simulation a piece of of that? Yeah. So, um, when I first discovered simulation, here was a place where um, the point was around teamwork and communication. So we were using a mannequin and we were performing medical procedures, but really. It was all about the teamwork and communication. And here, for the first time, was a place where, what did you say? Why did you say it? When did you say it? Who knew? Um, and why does it matter? That's all the stuff that is part and parcel of how we approach literature. Mm-hmm. And for the first time here, it was that I saw it in medicine. So it was um, instantly attractive to me. And that there you go. That I, I see. I didn't know that piece. That's really cool. Um, uh, so, what? Just as a general question for you, which I've, I've always kind of wondered, how would you state um, or describe the way that you see the world? So, how do you see the world, and how do you create um, new things out of this this vision? Yeah. Well, I. You know, I. I feel like there's some connection to negativity bias here. Okay. So, for example, uh, okay, we're about to do whatever it is. Um, the negativity bias and the threat assessment is, oh, my God, what could go wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the what could go wrong leads to how is what we're about to do not prepared for us to handle that potential threat? Okay. And then the immediate next thought is, oh, I now see things that are not there. So um, here's the way the status quo or the way we've done it in the past. Here's how that is not preparing us for this potential other thing. Um, And I, you know, for, for good or for good or worse, um, I guess that's my superpower, which is to see what's not there. Um, And really trying to lean into that, to think about how can we really um, energize those observations mm-hmm. for new for new creations. I love that because I think many times people use the superpower as a way to um, I think worry that people th- that people see what's not there and they worry about what could happen. But what I see is uh, here is a little twist in that. Um, is that an accurate statement? And, and how do you how do you not? Because so, I I know you and I don't hear a lot of times where you're talking about worries. I, I don't hear that from you. So how how do you keep that? Uh, how do, you, how do you use it for good, I guess, is the question. Well, you know, I, so here's another funny thing. that um, Years ago, I took a, a personality test, and um, one of the, <laughs> the conclusions of my personality type was this style of person doesn't think that they're right. They know they're right. And ah. <laughs> I, I think that that sort of um, tendency leads me to um, once I see whatever isn't there and I concoct an idea – um, I'm busy kind of trying to bring that to life. Gotcha. Um, and, and I'm kind of thinking about in, in my own life though, that the, if I see what's not there, it's usually in the negative as in what could go wrong. And what I hear is, and my experience of you is that you see what's not there that actually could go right. And, and how do we make that go right? Does that make sense? That, cause, cause I, I don't, again, I, when I work with you, um, I could see, again, if, if someone sees something that's not there, it's like, oh, these are all the potential things that could go wrong. Um, and then we worry about it and then we get upset about it. And that's not what happens. So that's, it's interesting. Does that make sense? Am I 
being clear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, so as I said, you, know, you are uh, the director of the uh, of Sale. So tell me about your experience with leadership. So uh, I've so first of all, how long have you been in leadership, and, and what got you into leadership? You know, uh, so that's also been an interesting kind of um, path. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, a, lo- a long time ago, I think I was about eight, something like that. My mom went to a parent-teacher conference, and she was curious and asked the teacher, is Christine a leader? And there was a long pause, <laughs> according to the way my mother tells the story. And the teacher said, well, I would say that Christine is a reluctant leader. Okay. Which is to say she would really prefer not be the one waving the flag and leading the charge. Um, but if she sees that um, thing, she, if she really feels that things should go a different way or people aren't coming together or what have you, um, that she'll step in and, you know, sometimes um, forcefully. <laughs> So, um, so, yeah, so that, so, I mean, I think that that really does characterize me. Um, but nevertheless, you get put on this path in life to, to follow one success after another. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I had a phase in my life where I felt that having influence on just one person. So as a clinician, it's me and one patient. I felt that that wasn't, um, I said, ah, I think I have more potential than that. And I, I began to have this um, appetite for, well, what if I could affect 10 people? Hmm. What if I could affect 1,000? Oh, my gosh, what if it could be 10,000? Um, and kind of went on this path of chasing this kind of arrogant dream. Hmm. And uh, several things happened around that time, including um, the untimely death of a colleague of mine and um, things that really shook me up. And... Um, what I learned from that is, uh, well, how first of all, how dare anyone say that to affect one other person's life is not enough for them. And uh, I really, that um, has stayed with me ever since that happened. So I kind of was on this path and sort of hit that sort of, I don't know what you call that, a roadblock or a gap in the road um, and really have re, re, rediscovered my purpose. That's interesting. Um, it sounds like it was kind of a fork in the road or, or a detour. Something happened, and then you kind of went went a different direction. So you said your purpose. So what is your purpose? Well, I don't know, really. Uh, I, I sort of, my purpose is to kind of uh, do things that I think are cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that's about, I mean, I guess that really, that's it. So it, it's, um, I, I refer to the colleague of mine who had an untimely um, death. Right. I, what I really took away from that is um, I live my life with kind of only one metric, which is when I die or if I were to discover that I am dying, will I say that was a good use of my time? Mm. And if the answer is no, then I say no. Um, and it's made re- life remarkably simple. So it stops this idea of chasing titles or chasing importance or chasing quantities of, I don't know, papers or trophies, those kinds of things. Yeah, but yet you're really successful. So that, that that's so interesting to me because I think that sometimes we there's this idea or this theory that we do have to chase all those things in order to be successful. We have to have a plan in place to 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 map our success so it's interesting that um that it sounds like you were on that path and then you kind of changed that path to uh, a new metrics to, to a new way of evaluating what's in front of you so that's so cool um so i also know that you love animals so i'm gonna put that out there so um i and i also I, I'm an animal lover too, so we talk about animals a lot. Um, I have a devil cat who I love to death, but she is a little, little um, cranky sometimes. And I think that my pet, uh, Melina, has taught me a lot about relationships, as in that we are both in relationship and that um, I need to, um, we, we collaborate on how we connect, how we uh, interact, and thus 
um, also learning how to build trust with another with another living being. So when I first got Melina, I could not touch her. In fact, she just bit me all the time. And now, like the other night, she's on my lap cuddling and she trusts me. So what have you learned from your animals? And first, tell, tell us all the animals that you have. But what have you learned and how has that knowledge maybe affected your life? Oh, I, you know what? I can think exactly of the story. Okay. So Leo, who is my Maltese mix, was my first. Actually, I didn't have pets growing up. So he was my first real pet. And uh, I got him. He was about, he was still probably less than a year old. I came home from work one day. It, I, it was late. The weather wasn't good. I didn't have a good day. I was mm-hmm. in a really bad mood. And he needed to go out. So I put on his leash. I went out. I was like, come on, let's get this over with. And out on the street were these two um, men who looked like, you know, football players. So they looked like jocks. So they, they looked like the last people on earth who would want to cuddle with a white fluffy puppy. <laughs> And they came up and they said, oh, can I pet your dog? They pet Leo. And then they stood up and they said, oh, my day just got 50% better. And they went on their way. This whole interaction was at maybe 20 seconds. Um, and I suddenly I was so taken aback because I thought, wow, I didn't let Leo make my day 50% better. And here I was angrily taking him on this walk. Um, right. And I, I, I will never, ever forget that. And so the one really important lesson from Leo and also these people is to let your animals always make your day at least 50% better. I love that. And we have a choice of what we let, you know, kind of affect us. I love that. And Leo's adorable. All of your animals are adorable. <laughs> so um, awesome. Um, so, Christine, so what if you were going to describe yourself like three words that describe Christine Park, what would they be and why? If I'm going to describe myself in three words, oh, God. Um, I'll give you five. I mean, you can, you can do five. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you're going to put me on the spot. So I guess I would say, I guess I would say, um, shoot. You would have to shoot? ask other people. Uh, I, I, um, I would say introverted. Which, oh, okay, uh, we're going to stop right there. So she told me she was an introvert. I'm like, you're what? <laughs> Why do you say you're an introvert? Oh, I'm a complete introvert. I, I'm, I'm not shy, which makes maybe perhaps me read as an extrovert. But uh-huh. um, I, navel-gazing I, is, my, is my strength. It's my other superpower. Um, and I do need, like, but, you know, um, after um, a period of time with especially large groups of people that I don't know very well, I do have a very hard shutdown. Like I can feel it. Yeah. Um, so I am. So introverted. Um, another, I would say. Is, wait, oh, wait, wait, uh, wait, one second. Wait, 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 one second. So introvert. So, but I just have to say that, so you were the president of the largest simulation society in the world. How many people are in that society? I mean, it was, I mean. Over, and, over 4,000? Yeah, in our conference. Like, it's humongous. That's the first time I ever saw Christine was she was up on stage. And, like, there's 4,000 people in the audience. So it's so interesting that um, who you are puts you in front of large groups of people and also interacting with large groups of people, and yet you're an introvert. So interesting. <laughs> well, you know, there have been very famous introverts uh, who were actors by, like, Ingrid Bergman and yeah. others that were pain- and painfully shy on top of everything. Right. I, and I, I, I am the same. Like I feel, I thought I was an extrovert, but I definitely get more energy by being my, being by myself or one-on-one with people. So we've had that conversation. So yeah, sorry to interrupt you. So your second, second word. My second word would be bridge. Um, bridge. Is that so right? I spend a lot of time um, feeling ill at ease because I feel like in many ways I don't fit in one place or another. So culturally, I, my ethnic background is Korean, but, you know, I was born in America, so I'm neither this nor that. Um, same for professionally. I'm not professionally a literature professor, but I don't always 100% identify with the stereotypical physician um, persona. So I'm neither here nor there on that also. Um, until one day, sometime in this past year, actually, I realized, oh, well, I can be a bridge. And by definition, a bridge cannot be on exclusively on one side or the other. Um, so the bridge's purpose is to create the connection. So I'm, I'm leaning into the discovery of that identity. You're a connector. 
Yes, love it. So, um, and then maybe an experimenter. I do um, enjoy the process of experimentation. I, I, I like to see outcomes, whether they turn out or not. Right. Yeah, that's been my experience with you. And um, also how you create and going back to that kind of seeing what's not there. So yeah. let's see if we can create that. So very, very cool. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, but um, what is one piece of advice or thought, or it could be actually a couple of thoughts, uh, that you have learned uh, along your journey that you can share with us about ways to... Um, create success in your life, whatever that may be. So maybe it's defining what success is to you, Christine, and then how what what you have found to be the most um, um, positive or most uh, influential way to, to get there. So, Well, you know, it's different for every person, right? of course. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I don't know, I think um, to follow the things that give you energy instead of the things that you feel that you should do. Um, and that can actually be much more difficult than, than meets the eye. Um, I don't know. Is that a platitude? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> you know, maybe it is. But it, it's really about um, listening to your inner voice than sort of who do, how do I want to present myself to the ex, you know, external world. Have you always been able to hear your inner voice? And if not, how did you come to hear that voice? I mean, I think I am, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I've always been relatively outspoken. So I, uh, you know, lucky that I wasn't born, for example, in North Korea, because I would be the one like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> right. um, you know, so I, I have been, and I, and um, sometimes I have felt the, um, the repercussions of, kind of baking out in a time that, you know, um, maybe um, wasn't very, um, wasn't very well received. Um, anyway, that's who I am. And I guess that's who I'll always be. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, hearing that inner voice and kind of, and, and um, kind of that barometer of what feels right to you. Yeah. Interesting. I found, um, and I had an experience this week where, um, I had to make a decision on something and my loud voice or my loud uh, inner voice was, was, was had one idea and then the small quiet voice had another. I'm still interested to kind of hear, I went with the loud voice. I was like, it just, it just logically made sense to make this decision, but yeah. my gut, my feeling is like, mm, I think I should have gone with that. So yeah. talk about experimenting. I'm like, I cannot wait to see what the feedback is on this. And maybe I will maybe trust that inner <laughs> voice a little bit more. So anyway, Christine, thank you so much for being with us, um, and uh, I'm I look forward to maybe having you on the show again. So have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you so much. It's yeah. been a blast. Yay! Thanks, Christine. Bye. Bye. See you. So we have just been talking to Christine Park, uh, so a uh, innovative leader that uh, was sharing with us her way of um, how she creates, basically. I mean, just this idea of looking at what's not there and then the opportunity to create that thing. So, which I, uh, having, being a colleague of hers and working with her in that capacity is something I really admire about her and something that I, until we were talking about this show, I didn't quite realize that that's what she was doing. Um, and she, it's also, as a leader, a way to challenge us as her colleagues to, to think about that which is not there and to think about what could be. So I think we always talk about that uh, in different facets of just life in general. How do we create whatever it is? And uh, this idea of being stuck uh, sometimes, even as a writer, sometimes it's, it's being stuck. I think that Christine brings up a really good point of that maybe if we look at what's not there, that that might 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 inspire us. I think I look at what's there and then how can I add on to it, which is, I mean, it's basically the same thing. But I think in the way that Christine talks about that, um, looking at the negative um, space and seeing what could fill it, that that actually changes the way to maybe think or to uh, inspire again uh, a different sense of creativity. So I cannot wait to actually try that with my, I do journaling every day, so I think I'm gonna start writing on that and um, such. Uh, so I actually want to kind of go back to skip 
a little bit because I feel like I did not get a good conversation with him. Because usually at the beginning of the show, Skip and I have a conversation and I learn about his week and I learn about how he's thinking about things. And um, we really just didn't have that time. So Skip, if you want to turn your microphone and um, let's chat. <laughs> and, um, and how are you doing, Skip? Uh, you said you were doing actually pretty well this week. So um, and what have what's your thoughts on kind of creating out of the quote unquote negative, uh, creating the um, opportunities out of looking at paper, maybe not what's not there. So um, what's your thoughts? Oh, well, first I, I went and got the. I uh, can't really hear you, I don't think. Maybe. I went and got the <gasps> brownie powder huh? hummus. It's, oh, get out of here. Okay, so <laughs> anybody's looking, here it is. It's really, really, really good. So, so right now? <laughs> if any kind of whatever kind of day you're having, just have some of that. It looks literally like chocolate fudge. Ch yeah, and it tastes it. Taste it. it Can I just stick my face in it? And go right ahead. Cracker. Go right oh ahead. Oh my gosh. <laughs> is this this is the first time I've ever like eaten on? A yeah. Burger. Well, you know, it's, we've suddenly become food critics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want to talk about these. Okay. So you lead me into this. Okay, so uh, Brian and I talk about this all the time. He watches these food deal reality mm -hmm. shows. I don't get it. I don't get it because I can't taste the food. So like, I, so they're making it. Like, I get the like the fashion ones or even RuPaul's Drag Race. Like, I can watch it and I can I can judge it like the the judges are. But food, you can't taste it. So how how do I know if it's good or not? Anyway, those are my. Yeah, I I have um, another friend, a mutual friend of Wait, ours, you Dale. Have, you have another friend? I do. Wait. I do. A mutual friend of ours, Dale, he like watches the baking show, the the English baking isn't that amazing? It's really good. <laughs> he watches the uh English bake off or whatever. Yes. Every season and then he'll watch it again. Really? Yeah. What does he get out of it? Not that I'm I, judging you, Dale. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean it's fun to watch because I like to cook. So you know, it gives me it gives me ideas. I learn. I learn from it. So you do learn. Okay. Yeah, I do learn from it, and it gives me ideas. And um, But, you know, it's the faces people make when they get it. It's like every time you never see, rarely do you see somebody go, mm, oh, that's horrible, right? It's always like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, on the English – a baking show or whatever it's called, the Bake Off. They do criticize. They do. Yeah, 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 they do. And it's in that tent, and um, yeah, I feel bad because it's always like the the like the people who are, mm, I don't want to say, the people who are more mm, everyday looking. I guess I'm gonna say. I'm trying to find a good word for that. Um, I'm always rooting for them, and then sometimes they don't win, and yeah, and I, and I feel like I'm waiting to hear what the judges say. And but they do these like teasers at the beginning, and I feel like it's like a, a guessing game of like, so are they going to be good? Or are they not going to be good? And, and I know, and they always show face. This is any reality show. They always show the facial expressions, of like when they're doing the teasers yes. that have nothing to do right. with what was just said. Yeah, they're lying to they're us. They're lying to us. To well, in reality TV show is, okay. So I'm gonna say, uh, let me see how I can tell this story real quick without incriminating people but there was a reality tv show that was filmed here and a good friend of mine was the producer of it and the first year they did it it was all quote unquote improv it was all whoever came in to wherever they were filming they would just do it and then a couple of years later they actually scripted the show from la they had scripts come in from la and they scripted it though it looked like the same and my friend was telling me about this. I'm like, that's horrible. I, I can tell the difference no matter what I could tell you in two seconds. And he showed me two or three episodes. Skip, I could not tell the difference between the scripted ones and the ones that were improv. So I was like, okay, I get it. Go ahead and script the <laughs> reality TV shows. I mean, do you know, if, if, if you can get a, you know, a, a better, uh, like the same product uh, and it can be an easier process, I get it. But uh, it just feels a little fake. So. Yeah, so I totally got mm. off the subject. I forget what your question was now. So my question was, how are you doing? Just checking in with you because I really think to check in with you. But also then, um, what are your thoughts about this creating from a negative space and as in what's not there? And um, and I think I've, I've used that, you know, what's not there as in worrying about what could happen. And Christine was talking about how that negative thing of what could happen, actually the opportunities that are there and how can you create 
Do you know? And I think all great inventors do that. My mind doesn't think that way, but I think all great inventors do that. But what are your thoughts? Well, you know, every week it seems like whatever the topic is, is like <laughs> right where I am, you know, You're having welcome. to. You're yes, <laughs> yes. It's like free you know coaching. It's like I'm psychotic. I'm, I'm sorry, psychic. Uh, psychic. <laughs> I'm schizophrenic. Uh, so we make a great team. Yes, we do. I, you know, I'm I'm in the middle of like making some decisions. You know, I have, I have uh, so many different ideas going on. There's the music ideas. There's the coaching ideas. There's the radio ideas. There's all these different production ideas that are are always going on and. Uh, a few weeks ago, or maybe last week, I just sat down and I wrote down all the things I could do. Mm-hmm. Not all the things I'm going to do in 2021, but yeah. it's like, what are the things I could do? Right. And so I just stopped editing my, you know, and just wrote it all out. And, um, you know, there's like 10, wor- 10 years worth of things there. And it was, so it was um, now, and I wrote, Okay, you can do all these things, but you can't do them all at once. Ah. So what are the things that are really important and are really speaking to you right now? So, you know, you can plan those and you can put those. I don't know if this is on topic or not, but you can plan those and you can create some goals from that. But along the way, um, some of those things may not work out. Right. That are going to steer you in a different place. Kind of like a... Detour? Perfect, perfect, perfect detour. detour. Exactly. Um, so when you're looking at like what is there and what is not there, uh, some of the things that you're looking at that you want to do that you have to create to put in place, right? Yeah. And then there are some of the things that seem like they're going away. So is that, you know, for me, I have to look at, you know, my higher power and get in my connection and say, is this goal that you have, is this what you're trying to do, something that is not there, do you need to do it in a different way? Mm. Or is it saying, stop this, just, you know, totally stop it. And that's where, you know, that gut feeling comes in. And right, it, I was it, just thinking of that. Yeah. And it can get really confusing because, you know, you have, you have the, the gut feeling of like, okay, this has to stop, mm-hmm. right? But then there's a different perspective And, you know, we want to toy with that perspective. And it's like, is this filling a gap? Um, Or am I um, turning off my gut? Yes. And I think to Christine's thing is, what is, what am I not seeing? And I I was thinking about this. And I think I need to do some more thinking about this is how can I uh, spark or... mm, ignite that ability to see what's not there in a, in a creative, positive way. Because um, I think in writing, I've, I've had blocks where I'm like, well, well, I don't know what to write next. Well, it's that, you know, what's not there, you know, that they should fill in. Like they say in negative space, you know, energy should come into it, you know, and whatever. So, hmm, interesting, interesting thoughts. Any other thoughts, Skip? Um, mm. You're like, no. No. <laughs> no, you're like, ah, uh, no, <laughs> not at all. Um, so, well, I have to say that uh, it's interesting. I, I've, I've been talking about the different voices in my head, which maybe it just means I'm crazy. That, that could be it. But I often talk about... Maybe you're schizophrenic, too. I have no doubt. Um, I worked <laughs> at a therapist one time, though, that um, she taught me about the committee in my head and um, that these committee members are all kind of like single visioned, but they um, they each have a, a purpose, and it's basically to protect me. You know, but but that I think that in sometimes making these decisions, I listen to one committee member instead of listening to the whole committee, and that a lot of my journey has been about taking down the walls to these different voices so that I can hear. Like there's sometimes when like a really good opportunity comes up. And I'm like, I should take that. And then this little voice will say, yeah, but you know, this is really what you want to be doing. And I'll try to shut that voice down because it's not what I, you know, it's not what the larger voice wants. And sometimes it's just being um, available and open to hearing that smaller voice of going, I really want this, but let me think about this too. And I think it's getting comfortable living in the gray. 
my life so much, it's easy to live the black and white, yes or no. Uh, in the gray, um, I think it's harder to make those decisions because sometimes these decision-making voices are softer and there's not a right or wrong. So um, I think it's getting comfortable with that. I had a sponsor once who told me I don't have um, a committee in my head. I have a carnival. <laughs> Circus. <laughs> She's like, Skip, you have a carnival in your yeah. head. I yeah. like carnivals, though. Yeah, I like carnivals, but I, you know, it, it was true. And they're, you know, anyway. No, I, I love it. <laughs> I, I always loved carnivals. And, um, you know, this week I was watching, I get stuck in these YouTube, you know, spirals. And did you know about old Chicago? What do you mean? So there was a, it was 1975, I think, in Bolingbrook for five years. There was this place called Old Chicago. Okay. And it was an indoor mall with a theme park inside of it. Oh, wow. And they had three roller coasters. It was amazing. I used to go there with my father. And they had a cir- what led me to this is they had a circus inside there. And I'd go see the circus. And they also had like a little magic show I'd go see and everything. But um, yeah. it's, it's That's and, awesome. It's totally awesome. And I love thinking about, um, I al- have always loved theatrics as in what's on stage, but also more interesting to me is what's going on behind stage. And I think that's one of the reasons that I'm a coach is, you know, what's really going on with me or others and what's really, you know, driving the show. So um, what we see on stage, there is a huge group of people making that show possible. And that always interested me. Like if I could go back, if I went back to school right now, one thing I would want to study is set design. I think that's always, it's just, it's amazing. So. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we're going. I don't know how we got to that skip, but um, we're there. Perfect so detours. It was a detour, a perfect detour. Perfect detours. Um, so I, I, once again, I want to thank the producer extraordinaire, Skip Sams, who produced this show today. Um, and also our guest today, which uh, who was Christine Park, uh, who shared with us the way that she creates, which is this idea of looking at what's there and then acknowledging what's not there and actually the potential, the possibility of what could be there to create that. Um, This show is every Saturday. Um, It's Perfect Tours with me, your host, Bob Kaiser. Um, Excuse me, it's Perfect D Tours. What did I just say? Perfect Tours. Did I? Yeah. Ooh, how interesting. Yeah. Perfect D Tours. Perfect D Tours. Maybe you're going on tour. Oh, I bring it on. (laughs) I would love that. I would love to go on tour with this, yeah. with this show. and Because I, I keep saying that, um, and I, I'm, we keep working on this, um, is that we're kind of isolated here in the studio and p- sharing our stories or sharing the, the guest stories. But you out there listening, you have all of your stories, and I'm dying to hear your stories. Um, the reason I'm a coach is not so I can... <laughs> like, I, I learn by being a coach. I learn by doing the show, so... Um, we should go on tour. Anyway, so perfect detours uh, with me, Bob Kaiser. So if you, during the week, get interested in in what I'm doing or want to communicate with me, I'm on several social media platforms. Uh, Facebook, you can reach me at Bob Kaiser. Um, in parentheses, Bobby Wince, because that was my pre-adopted name. Anyone who's listened in the past knows that I'm adopted. And uh, Kaiser is my adopted name. So look for me on Facebook. I also have a, a coaching page on there. Um, Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Bob Kaiser Coach. So please reach out, uh, private message me. Do you know, if you have thoughts about the show or um, topics that we should dive into, um, please, please, uh, please reach out. And uh, again, Skip mentioned before, but this station can always use support. So if you liked this show and want more of this show or other shows. Um, please feel free to go to our website, which is wghcradio.org, and make a donation. It's really easy. On the homepage, there's a place to donate money. So um, all donations are 100%. That's 100% tax deductible. So um, you can support a great radio station, and you can get some tax cuts. That's pretty cool. So anyway, I hope that you have an amazing week full of perfect detours making sure I say that correctly, detours, and that um, I wish you a week of negative space so that you can create amazing uh, experiences and uh, and, uh, outcomes. See you next week.